Hello, welcome to Xamarin University. My name is Rob Gibbons, and this is Xam 312, customizing the list view in Xamarin Forms. Before we begin, be sure to download all of the materials and source code from the Xamarin University website. You'll need those in order to complete the exercises in this course. This course is a follow-up to the previous course, where you learned about the fundamentals of using the list view control in Xamarin Forms. In this course, you are going to continue learning about this powerful control. We will start by seeing how to create our own custom cell definitions and customize the look and feel of the list view cells. Then, we will add headers and footers and group our data for easier scanning and navigating of the list view content. The fourth objective will help us customize the cell based on the runtime data, and we'll finish with some of the list view performance enhancements that you should be aware of. In this first section, we're going to look at how to define a custom cell definition for our list view and take complete control over how it renders each row. We have three things to talk about here. We will look at one more cell style that's available in the framework, and that's called the view cell. We will see how to create data templates and code, and finally, how you can create unique row visualizations on a per row basis. Now hopefully you are familiar with the basics of the list view and how it renders data. We cover that in our previous class, which is a prerequisite for this class. As a reminder, the list view gets its data from an IEnumerable data source, and that is going to be set on the item source property on the list view. Each item in that data source is then rendered using a cell style. You can choose the style from a variety of built-in cells and the cell is applied as a data template using the item template property. And those default, default cell styles are great, but sometimes out of the box isn't quite sufficient. Now look at the list view shown here. Notice that it's using three different text fields. And it's using box views to show the paint colors. But this particular layout can't be achieved with the default cell styles. To create custom visualizations in the list view cell, we use a view cell. A view cell is a list view cell that allows us to define the visual elements and layout. We can assign a view cell type to our data template. And the view cell will then host our custom layout. The view cell allows for just a single child, which must be a view. This will typically be a layout container of some type. Here we're using a stack layout. And just like the built-in cells, the view cell will utilize the binding context to provide the dynamic portions of the data that we want to display. We can add static pieces here as well. We would use labels, for example, to add some text. This approach is not quite as efficient as the built-in cell styles. They often rely on the platform-specific cell styles, and this forces the creation of a completely custom rendering. Now, just like the default cells, we can define our custom view cells in code as well. The key here is the assignment to the view property. This is what will be inflated when each cell is created. And to assign a view cell programmatically, you'll first instantiate a data template, passing in a lambda that instantiates your custom view cell. You can also provide the view cell type, and the data template will use reflection to create the instances for you. The data template is then assigned to the list view's item template property. The rows in a list view are uniform in height by default. The size that's reserved for each row depends on the type of cell being rendered. For de default cell styles, such as the text cell and the image cell, the size is fixed and determined by the platform. For custom cells defined with a view cell, the list view will attempt to estimate the required height by looking at your data. However, depending on what you have in the cell, it can be completely wrong in its estimation. So as an example, the screen here shows the default behavior, where we have a set of labels, and the labels are going to be increasing in size. We used a view cell here to adjust the font size, and that's not directly possible with a built-in text cell. The largest label, which would have been Ralph, is used as the final row height, and then that height is applied to each row. You can change this behavior by setting the row height property on the list view. This allows you to decide the fixed row height to use, and the system will apply that, even if the content overlaps, as you can see here in this screenshot. 
And by default, the row height value is set to negative 1, indicating that it should auto-calculate the value. Now it's time for our first individual exercise. Go ahead and open up the starthere.html that you downloaded from our materials on our website and start with exercise 1. If you have content that varies in height from row to row, you can get the list view to size each row independently by setting the has uneven rows property to true. This flag causes the list view to consult the cell representing the visualization of the row, and if the cell's height property is greater than zero, then it will be used as the height for the row. If the value is zero, then the list view reverts to its default behavior and uses the row height property. In some cases, this might work without any additional effort particularly if you're using the built-in cell styles. However, custom cells will probably not size properly without a little help. So if you're using a view cell definition, then your code will need to set the height property for each view cell directly. Since this is not a bindable property, you can't use data binding in XAML, which means you'll need to create an actual derived class from view cell and then set that property in code. Let's take a look at an example of that. So here you can see a simple partial view cell definition. And the key code is in the override of the on binding context changed. This is called when the data mapped to the cell is being altered. In this case, we use the text that we're displaying from the binding context property. This could also be some complex object or some, any other model data. We then perform some calculation on it. Here we're using the first letter of the text and making the height slightly larger based on the ascending sequence. This will then size the row using the value retrieved from the height when the list views has uneven rows property is set to true. And individual cells in the list view can be resized at runtime. The first step is to resize the content of the cell's child elements as needed. And then force the cell to recalculate its height by calling force update size. As you might expect, calling this method frequently can impact performance. So it should only be used as needed, not as a default strategy for sizing your cells. And you must set the has uneven rows property on the list view to true because the heights will be automatically calculated by Xamarin Forms. If it is not set to true, calling force update size won't have any effect. And that brings us to the end of our first objective of just introducing the view cell and seeing how to create our data templates. Next, let's look at how to add headers and footers into the list view. First, we'll define what a header is and what a footer is, and then we're going to see how to create a dynamic header and footer based on some runtime values. And to do that, we'll set the binding context for the header or the footer. And the list view control has support to render a header at the top of the control and a footer at the bottom. Now, this can be either simple text or it can be highly graphical and customizable. Either the header or the footer can be turned on and off independently. The data rendered into the header and the footer is controlled by two properties. There's the header to provide the header value and footer to provide the value for the footer. So here we're setting the footer to just a plain string value of paint available. That causes a label to be created and inserted into the visual structure. And this works, although it's not very pretty. It turns out that both of these properties are actually defined as type object. If you set the value of the property to something visual, then Xamarin Forms will simply insert your visual right into the list view. So here we have a content view with a label being added as the header. And this supports data binding. The binding context is whatever the list view's binding context is. And if you're a fan of the MVVM design pattern, then you might be wondering how you can use this feature as well. Well, the header and the footer are both bindable properties, but they are object values. And we don't really want to define our visuals in our view model that belongs in the view layer. So we have a second set of properties to define the visual structure for the data that's provided by the view model. We have header template, which is a data template for the header, and footer template, which is a data template for the footer. These two properties would be defined in XAML as your visualization. Notice that they don't involve cells like the other data templates that we've used up to this point. Instead, they're really just the instructions for the header and the footer. Now here's the cool part. The binding context for these two templates is going to be the header and footer properties of the list view. So 
you will bind the header property to something in your view model. Here we're binding to just a header text property that's presumably on our view model. And then we would define how to visualize it with the header template. Here's an example of the view model code. We're defining that header text property and the list view would data bind its header property to this property, which returns just a string. Then the header template would define how to render it. And this might sound a little bit complicated, but really it's not. So we have a flowchart here to describe how the list view figures out how the header and the footer work. We'll start by just asking, is the header and the footer defined? If it is, have we defined a template for those? If we have, then we'll inflate that template and we'll use the header or the footer property as the binding context. If we don't have a header template or a footer template, then we ask, is the value that we've assigned to those properties a visual element? If it is, we'll just stick that visual element into the list view at the appropriate place. If it's not, we'll simply call toString on whatever that object is and render a label with that text. Now, if there is no header or footer defined, then we ask, is the header template or the footer template defined? If no, then we don't have any header or footer. But if it is, then we'll inflate that template and won't have any binding context. And that allows you to define the look and the feel of the header, but not bind it to anything in a view model. All right, so let's go to our second individual exercise, and we're going to go ahead and add a header and the footer into the list view. Again, open up your start here.html and start with exercise two. In objective two, we learned how to add a header and a footer and how to customize it in our list view. In the next section, we're going to look at how the built-in grouping capabilities of the list view work. Now, enabling grouping support requires a few different things. We need our data to be structured properly. We need to tell the list view that our data is grouped, and we need to tell the list view how to render the group headers. So we'll see how to do that along with sorting, filtering, and grouping that data. And sorting the data can be done by changing the data bound collection. Sorting is easy. Just remove and re-add all the items or completely replace the item source value as you see here. Often it's faster to replace the entire collection instead of just adding and removing individual items. Filtering is performed on the bound collection. And this usually involves storing the original collection and then data binding to a filtered version of that collection. So here we're going to use a link query to filter the data. The UI is bound directly to the query, but we could also use a separate observable collection in a view model that manages the UI view of this data. And then when we are grouping our data, we have to tell the list view that we want to use the grouping support. This is optional and is turned off by default. So this is done by setting the is grouping enabled flag on the list view to true. And we also must structure the data to be grouped. The list view expects a collection of objects where each object is the group header and exposes a collection of child objects for that group. The parent group collection would be assigned as the item source. And the parent group becomes the group header and then each child in that group is then used as the rows displayed within the group. Unlike something like WPF, which also supports grouping, you can't specify a child property for the grouped collection. Instead, the group header object, which would be the objects in the item source collection, must actually implement iEnumerable and return the children when it's iterated. This actually becomes the item source for the group section. An easy way to do this is to derive your group object from some collection type, like a list of type T, or as you see here, an observable collection of type T, and then add the children to the group itself. Other properties can also be added to the group header object in order to display the group header visualization. Here we've added two, first letter and group name. At a minimum, you need some object to display the header text. And in our example, that's going to be the group name property. We can then use links to lookup extension method on our data and select the data that we want to group on and then generate a lookup collection. So here our key will be the first letter of the name and the items in the collection will be all the contacts that start with that letter we would have up to 26 unique group collections for letters A to Z. This collection of grouping objects is then assigned to the list view's item source property. And now the data is going to be displayed in groups. 
Once the data is grouped and the grouping support is turned on, then you can define the group header to separate the grouped data sections. This is the visualization that's going to be drawn above the rows that are contained within the group. This is done through one of two mutually exclusive properties. Either the group display binding, and that's going to be assigned to a binding that identifies a single property in the group header object to display, it ends up being a label. Now since we have a key property on our grouping structure, we can use that to display whatever we grouped by. In this case, that would be the first letter of the name. The second way to define the header is to use the group header template property. This is assigned to a data template with a cell definition, just like the normal row definition. And you can use any of the cell types, including a view cell. The binding context for the header will be the group header object representing the group. And you can bind to anything there. So this example is using the key from the grouping object along with the count property, which is inherited from the observable collection, base collection. The Xamarin Forms list view also supports the quick jump index. Its appearance is different on each platform. On iOS, as you see here, it's drawn on the right hand side of the screen. On Windows, it's activated by tapping on the headers, which presents a full screen selector UI. And on Android, it appears when the list is scrolling. You can set that through the group short name binding, which identifies the string for the group. The identified property would come from the grouping object. And here we're using, again, just a single letter, but whatever you return will actually be drawn in the index. Now in exercise three, we're going to add grouping and a quick jump index to our application. In objective three, we saw how to add grouping support to our list view. In this next section, we'll see how to change the cell style based on the data that's in each row. When we're displaying collections of data, we may want to change our appearance depending on the content. This could mean different values based on properties, or we might have a collection that stores different types but derive from a common base class or some other abstraction. For example, here we see a chat application. We could change the cell visualization based on who sent the message and maybe change the appearance depending on the message content. Does it contain text? Does it contain an image? Etc. We can make runtime decisions. Well, a data template selector is a special data template implementation that is able to return different data templates depending on the data in each bound element. Different data templates can present different cell styles for the list view. This allows us to completely customize the visual presentation based on our data. So to create a data template selector, we use the abstract data template selector class included in Xamarin Forms. We'll create a new class that derives from data template selector and then override the abstract onSelect template method. When that selector is used, the onSelect template method will be called for each item in the bound collection. And since the onSelect template method will be called for each item in our collection, and therefore every cell in our list view, we can make runtime checks on the data and decide which presentation style we want to use by providing a different data template. Notice that the onSelect template receives an item parameter. This is the bound data. We can cast it to a known type to reach properties on the item. So here we're checking if it's a sent message and returning the appropriate data template. We could use other checks and potentially use more than two different data templates. Keep in mind, this is just one strategy. You could also have different data types in your collection. For example, different implementations of a base class or an interface. And then in the on select template, you could check the type to decide which data template to use. You'll see that in your next exercise. Remember that it's the data template's job to create the cell for the visualization. That means we're able to reuse data templates for more than one cell, just as we've been doing throughout this course. We pass the type of cell we want to use when we're creating our data template and it creates the cells for us. This is very important to remember for performance. Always create just a single instance of each data template. If you create new data templates in the onSelect template method, this will have a negative impact on the memory usage and the performance. Also, make sure not to nest data templates. That means the onSelect template should always return a base data template for a single visualization. Don't return another data template selector. 
and you apply the template selector by setting an instance of your class to the item template property. This is possible because the data template selector class derives from the data template class. Under the hood, Xamarin Forms will check the type of the applied data template, and if it's a data template selector, it will call the onSelect template method. We can do this in XAML, as you see here, or in code. When we're using XAML, it's easiest to add the template selector into your page resources. Also, make sure that you set the has uneven rows to true if your templates and your cells are different heights. In exercise four, we're going to practice using a data template selector. Now in this final section, let's talk about how to maximize the performance of the list view. Xamarin Forms does its best to provide great performance in all the controls. However, the list view is particularly challenging due just to the number of layout calculations required while scrolling. Now, before we talk about performance, let's stop and recognize that you shouldn't performance tune your code until there's an actual problem. These tips that we're going to talk about are listed in the order that you should prefer them, but if you're happy with the scrolling performance of your data, don't mess with it. The built-in performance is usually okay. And before we get into optimizing the list view, let's talk about what is actually being constructed when we use a list view. So first, remember that the Xamarin Forms list view is rendered as a native platform control, which is going to be a UI table view on iOS, a list view on Android, or a long list selector on Windows. Each row in the native control is generated and populated with data using two interconnected elements. First, we have the logical side, or the model information. This includes the data item that's added to your collection, and this is used as the binding context. And the cell class, which describes the shape of the row. And we have built-in cell styles and the view cell for a custom shape. The cell is used to describe the desired visual layout for a single row, but it's really just the instructions of what we want it to look like. By default, there's a single cell created for each item in your data collection or your item source. And the cell is associated to its data row through its binding context property. And that points to a single item in the collection. And that cell must be translated into something that each platform understands. And that's the other half of this. The visual side of the row is all done using native platform code. So each platform's idea of how to visualize a row is different. We start with a platform cell renderer, which takes the logical cell information and generates a platform specific class to render it. This would be a UI table view cell for iOS, a view for Android, or a list view item for Windows. For the built-in cell styles, it either uses the built-in platform styles or the pre-built layout definitions for Android and Windows that are coded into Xamarin Forms. For custom cell styles described by the view cell, it takes the logical tree that's described by the view property and runs it through the normal rendering process to create the native representation using the native platform rendering system. So for example, a label would be turned into a UI text field, a button into a UI button, etc. Now, as you might expect, this rendering translation adds cost. That's why you'll see one of the pieces of, pieces of advice a bit later is to prefer the built-in cell styles if you can, simply because they are pre-optimized for the platform. Now, if you haven't spent much time with graphics performance tuning before, here's a well-known secret. High performance is usually a sleight of hand trick. It's all about caching and optimizing the memory and the CPU time through reuse. And to that end, each platform offers features to reuse and cache off the row visualizations. You'll see these techniques if you take iOS 1.10 and Android 1.10, where we examine the UI table view and the Android list view. Well, Xamarin Forms automatically takes advantage of these built-in visual caching techniques. For example, on iOS, it uses DQ reusable cell and it registers the custom cell types. This works even for your custom view types it caches off each view cell's render. So once it's evaluated, how to generate the native UI elements for a given view description, it saves, saves that off and reuses it when it needs to generate a new custom view. Xamarin Forms also provides three different caching strategies that affects how the list view caches the cell model on the Xamarin Forms side. We'll take a look at each one in detail. Keep in mind that UWP ignores the setting as it always tries to optimize performance. It's effectively locked to the recycle element. 
So the retain element tells the list view to create a new cell for every item in your list. Or said differently, it won't cache or reuse the cells. So in this context, the cell is the logical model or the UI description on the Xamarin form side. Using the retain element still allows the native controls to recycle the native visual cells. This is the default caching strategy. You'd want to use retain element when each cell has a large number of bindings. When I say large, we're talking 20, 30 or more bindings, or when the cell template changes frequently, or when testing reveals that the other caching strategies are slower. This approach tends to use more memory because it has to create and retain each cell. You can optionally enable recycle element caching strategy. This approach creates one cell per visible row instead of per data item. So as you scroll through the data, it reuses the model as well as the native control. This approach is more efficient and it uses less memory and is the recommended approach for most list views. You would use recycle element when each cell has a small to moderate number of bindings, less than 20, or when each cell's binding context defines all of the cell data, or when each cell is mainly similar with the cell template unchanging. When you're using a data template selector, you can use the recycle element and data template caching strategy. This is required to cache cells when you're using the data template selector. This improves performance by caching the cells and saving a reference to the cells associated data template, meaning we don't need to look up the data template every time the row is populated. But you must use the data template constructor that takes a type. To turn on this feature, you pass in the caching strategy to the constructor, and we support this in XAML as well. This has to be set during construction, and you can't change this at runtime. Traditionally, most of the original control renders on Android are composed of two views. There's a native control, such as a button or a text view, and a container view group that handles some of the layout work, the gesture handling, and the other tasks. This approach has a performance implication in that two views are created for each logical control, which results in a more complex visual tree that requires more memory and more processing to render on screen. Fast renders reduce the inflation and rendering costs of a Xamarin Forms control into a single view. Instead of creating two views and adding them to the view tree, only one is created. This improves performance by creating fewer objects, which in turn means a less complex view tree and less memory use, which also results in fewer garbage collection pauses. This can make a significant difference for list views when you're running on Android. Functionally, these fast renders are the same as the original renders. However, they are currently considered experimental and can be enabled by calling the forms.setFlags method from the Android main activity before calling forms.init. Let's talk about our data. Now, as we know, link is awesome but it produces read-only, forward-only innumerable collections. These can't be efficiently data-bound because they don't support random access. It also causes issues when you're updating the collections. So what we want to do is make sure that we always convert them to a list. And this is very easy to do. We simply just call to list on that uh, collection. Another thing to keep in mind is to watch your visual design. Loss of visual elements in your XAML translates to loss of measuring, layout, and rendering, all of which is really expensive. So if you look at this code here, it is trying to keep consistent spacing between the elements. It's using content view to provide the padding. Well, instead, we would prefer a layout like this. So here we're using the spacing property on the stack layout to provide the five pixel margin around each element. This is exactly the same output, but it's far more efficient and it only requires a single layout. Another common mistake is to place your list view inside a scroll view in order to add some piece of scrolling content to the top that wasn't actually selectable or part of the list. This is a very bad idea and it often breaks gestures because of competing handlers since the list view itself is a scrollable container. Instead, you'd want to use the header property to place your static content at the top. It's very likely that the header will do everything that you need since you can provide complex visuals there as well. Here's another thing that we see a lot. 
setting the default value for a property. This is wasteful because bindable properties have a default value associated with them. So if you don't set it, it uses that default value. Setting the property to the same value is pointless, but the compiler can't detect that, and so we end up going through the unnecessary assignment. Now, text is another expensive area. In particular, measuring text is expensive. So we should prefer not to wrap text if possible. That forces multiple evaluations to determine the wrap point. Also, Android doesn't support vertical text alignment directly, so Xamarin Forms has to do the offsetting, which requires a remeasurement. We also want to make sure we batch up changes to labels that are updated frequently so that we avoid the measure and layout pass. And if you have a bunch of static labels, consider using just a single formatted string object with run elements to render it as a single element. Another area that often kills scrolling performance is images. Images are loaded into memory as full-sized images, and then they're resized when they're rendered. That means if you load a 256 by 256 by 4 image, you're using 260K of memory to hold it. If you then just render that as a 64 by 64 tile, not only does the system have to scale and resample that image, which takes CPU work, it will do that every time it draws. Now, it's much more efficient to simply just provide properly sized images using the native platform's image handling mechanism. The type of image can make a difference as well. You want to prefer PNG for lossless quality, particularly very small icon style images, like what we might need in list views. But then you would use JPEGs for larger picture quality images. These load faster than PNGs of the same image because they're smaller and uh, file IO is often the limiting gate. Now, if you download images dynamically, then make sure to do that asynchronously using tasks or an async API. And there's typically a few things that in general can cause layout and therefore scrolling performance issues related to rendering your views. Either using view cells with lots of child views or using layouts that require lots of measurement. And here you can see some of the tips to optimize those custom layouts. By default, the list view performance is usually just fine. But if you do encounter problems, make sure you go through and use some of these optimizing techniques to make it even faster. And that brings us to the end of our XAM 312, customizing list views in Xamarin Forms course. Thank you for your time. Have a nice day.